We're glad to see you. We know that you're here, not by accident, but because the Lord God has called you by name. He has held you in his hands and he has said, come and worship with my family at Cedar Creek. So we welcome you here. Now, even though the skies outside are gloomy, it is totally bright in here. The canopy of heaven is open for you. 
Please don't leave with any needs unmet. He is here to meet your needs, and we are here to give him praise. Here we are at Cedar Creek, a multi-generational church, reaching up and reaching in and reaching out to our community. Let's have our opening announcements, and I think maybe that you may have seen them up there on the screen, but nevertheless, we'll go over some. <coughs> Next Sunday, we'll have installation and ordination of elders. January 14th is Res Kids, and the 21st is Resurrection. The 28th is a funds audit at the Mass. February 4th, please put this on your calendars, the session annual planning meeting. And then February 5th is a congregational meeting, and we traditionally have a Super Sunday that day. Is that what we're gonna have? We got any agreement on that? Super Sunday. Everybody bring a soup and we'll all have us a big pop up. All right, that'll be great. Wednesday night Bible study is going to resume this week, seven o'clock at the manse, and then next week is the installation of elders, as we said before, and the Karis class resumes this Thursday at six p.m. at the center, and next Sunday the Spiritfield Fellowship will resume. And I think, uh, Becky, have you got the meal that night? Yes. Well, Becky and Beth will be the cooks that night. So we look forward to seeing you. And also next Sunday, we want to be taking down the Christmas tree at 3 p.m. So it'll be great. I have a note here from Penny Greg to read to the congregation. If, if you don't know, Penny was diagnosed with cancer and broke her ankle at the same time. So she's had quite a year of it, and so she like she sent this card, a beautiful card. First of all, I would like to thank the good Lord for setting me cancer free. I would also like to thank everyone for the prayers and the visits and the phone calls during my time of sickness, which started April 1st, 2016. God bless you all from Penny Greg. And I'll post that on the bulletin board. Today, the opening praise is going to be oceans. We'll all be hitting it cold. All right? So, you know, just thought, don't say I don't know this song, because these people up here can say that too. But we're going to do it, and we're going to praise the Lord. We're going to worship Him in His spirit and in truth. And then the hymn of praise right after that, if you want to look in your hymn book, it will be up here. Number nine, teach us what we yet may be. That sounds totally strange, doesn't it? But it is the Beethoven of the Joy, so you'll be able to sing it right now. It'll be cushioned. So let's have a prayer and we will worship the Lord God. Heavenly Father, thank you for this awesome day that you have given us. Thank you, Lord, that you created us in your image to praise you and to be all that you call us to be. Thank you, Lord. We worship you, almighty God. We thank you for this time that we can set apart and we can just dedicate ourselves to hearing from you, to worshiping you, to glorifying your name. And we thank you, Father God, Lord Jesus and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's stand as we worship the Lord. <coughs> Oh, <laughs> 
Isn't it glorious? <coughs> Wonderful. Wonderful. Let's take a few moments and agree with God on the things that we have done that have fallen short of His glory. We call that confessing our sins. He calls that coming clean. Let's pray. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven.
how great I are. I think that's number two. Is that <laughs> number two? Number two. You can go ahead and sing it from the name. Let's sing it. Let's sing it. Let there be light, 
and there was light. God, God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God, and God said, let there be a halt between the waters to separate the water from water. So God made the vault and separated the water under the vault from the water above it, and it was so. God, God called the vault sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, Let the water under the sky be gathered to one place, and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God, God called the dry ground land, and gathered the waters to call the seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, Let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it, according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation. Plants bearing seeds according to their kinds, and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening, and there was morning the third day. And God, and God said, Let there be lights in the vault of the sky to separate the day from the night. And let them be served as signs to mark sacred times and days and years. And let them be lights in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. And it was so. God made two great lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He also made the stars. God sent them in the vault of the sky to give light on the earth. To, to govern the day and the night, and to separate light from darkness. And God saw that it was good. There was evening, and there was morning, the fourth day. And God said, Let the water teem with living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth across the vault of the sky. So God created the great creatures of the sea, and every living thing with which the water teems, and that moves about in it, according to their kinds, and every winged bird according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. God blessed them and said, Be fruitful and increase in numbers, and fill the water in the seas, and let the birds increase on the earth. And there was evening, and there was morning, the fifth day. And God said, Let the land produce living creatures according to their kinds, the livestock, the creatures that live upon the ground, and the wild animals, each according to its kind. And it was so. God made the wild animals according to their kinds, the livestock according to their kinds, and all the creatures that move along the ground according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. Then, then God, God said, said, Let us make mankind in our image and in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea, and the birds in the sky, and over the livestock, and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in numbers. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Then God said, I give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth, and every tree that has fruit with seed in it. They will be yours for food. And to all the beasts of the earth, and all the birds of the sky, and all the creatures.
creatures that move along the ground, everything that has a breath of life in it. I give every green plant for food, and it was so. God saw all that he had made, and it was very good. And there was evening, and there was morning, the sixth day. May the Lord bless the reading and hearing of his holy word. The sermon hymn is number 206, We Three Kings of the Orient Heart. The kids will be dismissed to go to Children's Church on the last verse.
Washington, India, Africa. But we can have peace with our neighbors. We can have peace with our family, our brothers and our sisters. I have two brothers here today, and I thank God that I have peace with them. So I wish you peace for the new year. Spread to everybody you see. Our scripture today is found on page uh, 1645. It's from 1 John. Be reading verses 1 through 18. <laughs> In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. Through Him all things were made. Without Him nothing was made that has been made. In Him was life, and that life was the light of men. <coughs> the light shines in darkness. But the darkness has not understood it. There came a man who was sent from God. His name was John. He came as a witness to testify concerning that life, so that through him all men might believe. He himself was not the light. Excuse me. He came only as a witness to the light. The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. He was in the world. And though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Children born not of natural descent, nor of human decision, or a husband's will, but born of God. The Word became flesh and made His dwelling among us. We have seen His glory, the glory of the one and only, who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testifies concerning him. He cries out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has surpassed me, because he was before me. From the fullness of his grace we have all received one blessing after another. For the law was given through Moses, grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. No one has ever seen God but God, the one and only, who is at the Father's side, has made him known. This is the word of God, the people of God. year. Oh, excuse me. I just realized I'm short. I'll, I'll change it. <laughs> the year was 1963. It was a year of chaos in the United States. <coughs> Racial tensions were high, very high. The 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama had just been bombed by the Ku Klux Klan. And when that happened, four teenage girls attending Sunday school were killed. It was my freshman year at Stetson University, and that in itself was chaos enough. My boyfriend had gone off to Peabody Conservatory, or as they say, Peabody Conservatory, in Baltimore, and I really felt all alone. Grace, perhaps you can relate. No mama, no daddy, no sissy, no bubba. 
no bitch, and oh well, no boyfriend. All the adjustments of living in a dorm with little or no privacy, having to be responsible enough to get myself up in the morning and go to class on my own. And then facing the challenge of real college work. Mm -hmm. That's when you find out, oh boy, I'm, I guess I'm going to have to study. And then I found out, I discovered that I had really bit off more than I could chew when I decided to major in music. Well, regardless of what was going on in the world, my life was just turned upside down. It took a little while, but finally things settled down to the new normal. September, October, November. All of us were getting excited about going home for Thanksgiving. And don't you know my history teacher decided to give us a test that last day, that Friday. Well, when we finished our test, we were free to leave and go home. And since that was my last class, I was excited to get to leave school for the first time. And my cousin was coming to pick me up in just an hour, and in two hours, I could be at the beach. I walked out of class as happy as a lark when I realized no one in the halls was smiling. No one was cutting up or anything. It was just silent. It was like everyone was in shock. And then my flute teacher came up to me with tears streaming down her face, and she said, she really talked like this. Oh, Mossy, the president has been shot. President Kennedy is dead. Wow. Yes, it was 1963, and the nation was really in chaos. And yet, even in that tumultuous year, there's one memory I have that stands, stands out as the most important, as being seminal in my life. And it remains a defining moment, even to this day, and I am awestruck by it. Let's stand and pray. Heavenly Father, who out of your great love sent Jesus our Emmanuel, we worship you. Lord Jesus, word of the Father, now in flesh appearing, we worship you. Holy Spirit, guide of the ages, we worship you. Lord God, three in one, guide our thoughts through this hour, we pray. And may we learn of you. May we grasp your infinite love. May we be forever absorbed into God consciousness. Because we have had this meeting of the minds with you today. In Jesus' name we pray, believing and receiving. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> if you are old enough to remember that November 22nd, you may be wondering what on earth could have happened in a freshman's life that could be more formative than a presidential assassination. Just this one thing. Now, you may not know this, or you may know this. Stetson is a Baptist school. And so in that school, all students are required to attend chapel, and all students must have a year of the Bible. Well, I came from a Baptist family, and where Bible reading every day was stressed, and being able to take Bible courses twice a year, that was stressed. And I just thought, I'm going to ace this course. Never did it occur to me that I would meet the God of the Bible right there in a college classroom. But meeting my dad in the very first class. That little professor walked back and forth, back and forth. And finally, he stopped and he said these words. In the beginning was the Logos. And the Logos was with God. And the Logos was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. And without him was nothing made that was made. 
He continued on. And the Logos was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as the glory of the Father, of the only begotten Son of the Father, and he was full of grace and truth. If we believe in him, if you believe in him, he gives us the power to become the sons of God. You know, that teacher taught us many things in that first year about the Bible. But the most important thing he taught us was to be centered on the first chapter of John, on the Logos, because in his word, that revelation makes the whole Bible make sense. So if you don't mind, let's take our Bible and open it to John chapter 1, and we'll do a little bit of exposition here, not too much. It might get a little teachy, but inspiration will come later, so hang in. All right, so when you've got it, John chapter 1, say, I've got it. Got it. <coughs> We're waiting for the back of the church to say, God is. You got it, Stephanie. You don't even have that Bible cracked open. You're going to have to take my word for it, aren't you? Yeah. All right. Well, you may be asking yourself, there she goes. <laughs> Breaking down if you're getting that Bible out. <coughs> you may be asking yourself, well, what is this Logos? And what's the difference between saying Logos and saying the Word? Well, Logos means the expression of thought, not just the name of the object. Logos is the word of God forever unchanging because it reveals who he is. In calling John, in calling Jesus the Logos, John was saying that Jesus totally and completely expressed the thoughts of the Father and was manifested in a physical body so that the world could read them. Now that's a little wordy, pardon the expression, but John is saying that by knowing Jesus in the flesh, the people could understand the thoughts and the essence of God the Father. Hebrews 1.3 puts it this way, Jesus is the express image of God. He is the brightness of God's glory. Now if you want to get more understanding on that phrase, you'll just have to join us at the Karis study. From verse 3 of John 1, let's look at verse 3. We can see that God created all things through Jesus. Hebrews 1, 2 says that through the Son, God created the universe. Colossians 1, 16 tells us that Jesus, through Jesus, God created everything in the heavenly realms. Everything that we can see was created by Jesus. Everything that we cannot see was created by Jesus the Logos, the Word. In verse 4, we see that Jesus is the origin of all life. Do you see it? In Him was life. Yes. In Him we live and move and have our being. Acts 17. Colossians 1, verse 17. Jesus existed before anything and He holds everything together. John 5, verse 26. Jesus says of Himself, the Son has life in Himself. In 1 John, we say, God has given us eternal life, and that life is in His Son. Whoever has the Son has life. Whoever does not have the Son does not have life. Going on to verse 5 of John, John, verse 1, I mean, chapter 1, we see that Jesus is the light source, the light of the world. He shines into the darkness of this world, but those who choose to remain in darkness can't perceive it. There is a Greek word used here by John. I'm going to try to say it. Do we have any Greek scholars here? Okay, then the way I say it is right. <laughs> Catalambano. Now you try to say it. Catalambano. There you go. It has a wide <coughs> range of, of meaning. It's, it's more than what, what we could say in the word perceive or anything like that. It explains that people choosing the darkness 
just don't get it that they are in darkness. They can't comprehend the light. They cannot apprehend it. They cannot overcome it. It will shine on forever regardless of the circumstances. Regardless. Now let's look just a little bit further to verse number 12. Verse 12 of John 1. Yet to those who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become the children of God. Now to understand what John is saying here, we need to connect some dots. John 10, 10, there you have it, the acid test of whether something is from God or something is from the devil. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and to destroy. But I have come that they may have life more abundantly. They may have abundant life to the full till it overflows. The word life here is Zoe, the very life force of God. To those who believe in Jesus, he gives the Zoe life of God, the essence of God. Believers receive supernatural power, not only eternal life in heaven, but victory here in life too. So those who are truly born of God, those who have the Son, you say, that's me. Do you hear they didn't even say it? I'm going to give them another chance. All right. Those who are truly born of God, those who have the Son, you say, that's me. That's me. That's much better. They have the power of God to enable them to win in life. They may not be aware of that power. They may not use that power, but they have it. And finally, in our study of John 1, verse 14, the word, the Logos, became flesh and made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now, a casual reading of that sentence will give you an impression that Jesus and God the Father are just sitting up there on a glory cloud and they're looking down and they said, things are in a mess. And the Father said something like this to Jesus, why don't you go down to planet Earth for a while and see if you can't do something to straighten those folks out? But truly, what is being expressed is the passion and the love of the Father for his creation, birthing out of himself his very essence and taking on the very molecular structure of humanity and coming here in a form where people could actually see him and see his yearning and his love and his compassion for them. Before Jesus came, people only knew God by the law. This is the way to do things. If you don't do them, or if you don't do them exactly right, you're going to have to pay the penalty. That doesn't mean that God was not a loving father then, before Jesus came. No. God says in Malachi, I am the Lord. I do not change. The people saw God as a judge. That's how they perceived him before Jesus came. A judge that had to be appeased. But when Jesus came, the word, the logos, he was the embodiment of truth. He was the embodiment of even the law and the embodiment of grace, unmerited favor, unearned love, unlimited access to God the Father. Before Jesus, just truth. With Jesus, grace and truth. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. And all of these works to introduce us to God. John 1. And now, we're ready to study Genesis 1. In the beginning, God. Let's turn to Genesis 1 for just a moment. I guarantee you it's not as long as that John teaching. 
You're going to read that first sentence. You've got it from the away. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And you'll notice that there is no argument to establish the existence of God. That is because we find in Romans 1 that all people are born with an intuitive knowledge of God. The book of Revelation calls him the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the first and the last. He is the creator, not just a superior intellect who has figured out how to manipulate nature. No, he made it. Now, look at verse 2. Immediately, we are introduced to the Holy Spirit who was there from the beginning. Verse 3, and God said, let there be light. God spoke everything into existence. Now connect the dots. God spoke. What did he speak? Words. The word. The Logos. Everything physical that we can see was created by the Word. The Lord Jesus present at creation. As God spoke him out of himself, words are the parent force. They are the greater force. It is the first law of operating in the spirit realm. And as human beings made in the image of God, we have been given that law to use or to abuse. Death and life are in the power of the tongue, and they that love it will eat the fruit thereof. Proverbs 18, verses 19, 20, and 21. The NLT puts it this way. The tongue can bring either death or life. Those who love to talk will reap the consequences, Paul. It is when you know the word of God and you choose to use his words rather than your words, that circumstances change. Everything you say, everything, you say everything, 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 everything physical, will respond to words, either positive or negative. So let's recap. In the beginning was the Word, the Word of God. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word is God. The Word is Jesus Christ. Jesus means Savior. Christ means the Anointed One. Jesus Christ, the Anointed Word of God that brings salvation, brings deliverance, healing, freedom from oppression, <clears throat> intimacy with the Father, bringing eternal life. When we speak his words, we bring God on the scene. In the beginning, God. Through our lives, God. Today we sang that praise song, Oceans. You call me out upon the waters, the great unknown where faith may fail. And there I find you in the mystery, in oceans deep. My faith will stand. Here we stand at the beginning of a new year. It's as if our Father God who lives in eternity is calling us out upon the waters of an unknown segment of time. A place where our feet may fail. But when we find Him in the mystery, our faith will stand. Imagine, if you will, you can close your eyes to do this if you promise not to go to sleep. Imagine that you are standing on the seat, on the step. Sorry, I'm trying to get it out. Imagine that you are standing on the sand. And you're looking out to the vast sea in front of you. Imagine that you hear the voice of God calling you. Don't put your toes in the water, but start to walk on it. And as you go further with God, see yourself among a crowd, some with floats, some freestyling it. Look around, are you the only one walking on top of the waves? 
as you cast your vision wide, discover that you are not alone in your faith walk, but you are truly surrounded by those who have gone before you and those who are accompanying you now on your faith journey. Now the winds begin to rise, and with the wind, the waves begin lapping on your feet, and they start rising. What is your reaction? Is your first impulse to cry out, help me, I'm going to drown? Or is it to declare the words of the divine Logos, the one who calms the seas? It's your choice. The following is a true story. This is Skip. I think you're going to like this. Alan Ryden was a professional fisherman and he was the pastor of a small church in Kodiak, Alaska. He was returning home after a fishing trip when he got caught in a sudden storm. Even though he was relatively close to land, and it was only 2.30 in the afternoon. His boat got hit by a sudden gust of wind, and it was blown over on its side, and it began taking on water. He immediately went into the cabin and sent out a mayday signal, SOS, but no response. He quickly pulled on a fleece jacket and his survival suit as the water poured into his cabin. He managed to send off another mayday call, and then as the water rose and pressed him against the ceiling, he fought his way out and managed to get into his raft and get it loose from the ship's rigging. There was never a response to his call. Alan was confident that he would be found soon because he had the most advanced safety apparatus on his boat. It would send out a locator signal as fast as the boat sank. Well, to make a long story short, Alan's boat did not sink right away. And he found himself caught in the middle of a storm in the frigid waters off the coast of Alaska, hanging on for dear life to that little raft and wondering, what on earth can I do? As the hours passed, with no sign of rescue, Alan focused his thoughts on the power of the spoken word. I shall live and not die, he declared over and over again. Find that in Psalm 118. I shall live and not die. He remembered the prophetic words that had been spoken over him, and he declared, even as the raft was tossed into the air and flipped upside down and he struggled to turn it right side up, I can't die yet because these prophecies have not come to pass. His thoughts raced, trying to recall the promises of God. Fear not, I am with you. Fear not, I have ransomed you. I have called you by name. When you go through the deep waters, I will be with you. When you go through the rivers of difficulty, you will not drown. And as the hours passed over and over again, his thoughts would turn dark, just as the darkness of night was surrounding him, and the seas showed no signs of abating. He remembered the words. He struggled and remembered the words. Can't you just picture yourself, oh God, let me remember the Bible, let me remember the Bible. Come on, give me some words from the Bible. God, help me, help me, help me. All right, that's how I would be. He remembered those who trust in the Lord will find a new strength, and they shall mount up on wings as eagles. Alan said that at this time he had just a communal time with God, just a continuing time of just being in God's presence. He didn't feel like he was praying to him so much as just having this ongoing conversation with God and God talking to him. And he felt like God was not offended by him being so, so up. Uh, having so much nerve to say, I'm just going to have some time with you, God, you know? He felt like God was encouraging him all the way, every way. He felt the Lord saying to him and bringing these words to life, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And then all of a sudden, in the dark of night, he remembered Psalm 91. 
for he shall give his angels charge over you to keep you in all your ways. And then he remembered a teacher telling him, some people wonder whether angels exist. I don't wonder. I just use them. And so at that moment, Alan began commanding his angels to go. Go, set off that emergency beacon in the lifeboat. I mean in my boat. Go and tell my wife that I'm in trouble. Go and tell the intercessors to pray for me. Go, go, and finally go and tell the Coast Guard. Guide them. Bring them to me where I am. He was in desperate need. He was near exhaustion. He was cold. <coughs> Would you give up hope? He was in 30-foot seas. And later, he saw the Coast Guard timeline. 8.51, emergency signal received. 8.52, contacted his wife. 8.53, a Coast Guard C-130 was launched to find him. After they pulled him out of the water after midnight, finally, he had been in that Alaskan water for more than 10 hours. And amazingly, he had no lingering after effects. A Coast Guard survival expert told him that he was the survival story of the year. And he said, it's a great time to be a Christian, isn't it? And the message Alan has for us as Christians is that we need to get a handle on who we are in Christ and what privileges that we can walk in if we choose to apply the truth of God's Word, if we apply the Logos, the essence of God. He says, the battle in the spirit realm is definitely heating up now, and it is imperative that we walk in the authority Jesus paid for and then gave to us. I'm quoting him. We are in a state of being actively deceived if we stay focused on our weaknesses and walk in anything less than what we are. We will walk and have what we say and think. <coughs> it is a big battle for our minds and our tongues now because the enemy is well aware of what we can do if we actually believe the word. His last words to us are to guard our time in the word, to be sure that we are focused on getting full of the word of God, because he says, and you know this is true, when that time of crisis hits us, we most likely won't have time to go grabbing our Bible. As we enter into this new year, the days to come for us may be as challenging as being in the ocean, struggling for survival. Whether it has to do with our health and our finances or our well-being or our family, whatever it is, we can remember the words to oceans. Your grace abounds in deepest waters. Your sovereign hand will be my God. Where feet may fail and fear surrounds me, you've never failed and you won't fail now. We can know that the same in the beginning God is the same God today. The same loving God who paid for us to be supernaturally equipped sons and daughters. And that God is still with us wherever we go, and we can call upon his name and keep our eyes above the waves. When oceans rise, our souls can rest in his embrace, for we are his forever, and he is yours, and he is mine. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for giving us your word. Thank you, Lord, that when we take your word and we speak it 
and we act on it, that we bring you on the scene, and everything will respond. Thank you, Lord, for it. We give you praise. We ask for God to be put around our hearts and our minds, that we will not forget this word today. In Jesus' name, amen. The hymn of commitment today is in your hymn book, number 202, As with Gladness, Men of Old. <coughs> Let's stand as we sing. We'll pray for you. Bye. 
last chance. My father's having surgery on Tuesday. What's his name? Gary. What's his last name? Gunner. Thank you. You think I know, but sorry. Right. <laughs> okay. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, our glorious one, you who at this moment are hid from our side, but we know that you shine. Lord God Almighty, surrounded by myriads of angels. Lord God Almighty, whom the saints worship and adore, we come to you thankful, thankful people. Thankful that we're your children. Thankful for your word to us. Thank you for Jesus. Jesus, thank you for coming. <coughs> we're thankful for the Holy Spirit, who is our present companion. We glorify you, Lord God Almighty, and we thank you that in your word you tell us to come to you to cast all our cares on you, for you care for us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for telling us to come boldly right to your throne and make our requests. And so now, Heavenly Father, we lift up our requests to you. We pray for Gary Gunner, who will be having surgery this week, and we pray for him to have successful surgery and an uneventful recovery. We pray, Heavenly Father, for Wheezy, having tests this week, that she will have good, good results. We pray for Robin as she travels home or travels to visit friends. We pray that you will keep her safe and that she will be kept in your warm embrace. We pray for Mary Ann as she travels home from Murfreesboro. We thank you, Lord, that you watch over all of us all the time. We give you thanks, Lord. Now, Heavenly Father, we pray for Harvey Connor, for him to be returned to help. And we pray for everyone that has trouble in their throats this day, trouble in their vocal cords. We command those vocal cords to go back to normal. And we command the frog in the throat to be gone. Your history, get out of here. Get. You're not from God. And you don't belong to us. And Heavenly Father, now we lift up heavy fillers to you and Martha. We thank you, Lord, that Martha is a woman of faith. We thank you, Lord, that she stands on your word. By his stripes, we were healed. Thank you, Lord, that your name is Jehovah Rapha, that you are the healer. It's your name. I am the Lord who is your healer. And it's what you do. You heal us. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. And we lift up Eddie to you. And we command anything that is standing in the way of Eddie's complete and total healing to move. We command you to move mountain of resistance in the name of Jesus. I command you to bow your knee to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and to be gone from Eddie. I command the forces of hell to cease and desist their attacks on Eddie's body command you to be gone. We submit ourselves to God and we resist you, devil, and you must flee. So be gone in Jesus' name. <coughs> Heavenly Father, I speak to Eddie's kidneys now and say, kidneys, be healed and work. I speak to Eddie's lungs and I say, lungs, be healed and work. I speak to Eddie's heart and I command you to come back to normal. I speak to every organ in his body, and I command you to return to normal now in Jesus' name. I speak to every system in Eddie's body, and I command you to line up with the word of God. By his stripes, we are healed. And so now, Eddie, in Jesus' name, we command you, be healed. And I thank you, Heavenly Father, for the miracle. I thank you, Lord, and I declare it, I decree it, and I give you praise for it now. In Jesus' name, we, the church, we say amen together. We join our hearts and our faith together, and we resist 
anything that has come against Abby now in Jesus' name. And Heavenly Father, we would also pray for our military, wherever they are, and whether they're near, whether they're local, whether they are in the United States or whether they are scattered abroad. We pray for them, for your blessing and protection to be over them. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that the day will come soon when you say, mission accomplished, you may go home now. And we welcome them back. Heavenly Father, we pray for all of those who are in authority over us, the President and his cabinet, the President-elect and his cabinet. We pray for peace, as Anne said, peace in our nation, Lord. We pray for unity in our nation. We pray, Heavenly Father, for a smooth transition. And we pray for this nation to be one nation under God. And we thank you for it, that that is our calling and that is our destiny, to hold out the light of freedom to the world. We thank you for it. We praise you for it. And we thank you, Lord Jesus, that you are the one who created this nation. We thank you for coming to earth for us. We thank you that we are a covenant people. And that you are here with us now. We thank you for the prayer that you taught us to pray. And we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And now let us continue our worship as we joyfully bring to the Lord our tithes and offerings.
bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Now and forevermore. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you.